Welcome to the Young Heretics Halloween Special. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the Young Heretics Halloween Special. Um, so, it's Halloween. And it's a very weird one because Halloween is like basically canceled. Um, <laughs> at least as of right now, I assume that there will uh, not be as much trick-or-treating this year because our divine overlord, Dr. Fauci, has declared that we must never see or touch one another ever again. Uh, as you can tell probably from the tone of my voice, I uh, think that everybody should disregard this entirely and go trick-or-treating and have a lot of fun. I'm going to make an argument for why Halloween is important on this episode. But since it's a, kind of a weird time for holidays and it can be hard to feel um, the excitement that we usually feel at the holiday season, here at Young Heretics, we will be bringing the holidays to you with this Halloween Episode. Halloween is a time for reckoning with the dark things that lurk just at the edges of your sight. And hopefully by the end of this episode, you'll have a sense for why we have traditions of doing that. Um, Halloween has been canceled lately in more ways than one. Besides the COVID lockdowns, there have also been a number of accusations of cultural appropriation associated with Halloween, as you probably know, right? At Yale, as you may recall, my alma mater, I am afraid to say, in 2015, Nicholas and Erica Christakis became names that would live in SJW infamy. This was the whole thing over, well, should people be allowed to wear whatever costume they freaking want? Or should people be constantly hemmed in by anxieties that this particular costume might represent the appropriation of some other culture that does not belong to us. This idea, right, that only certain races and certain people of certain races may wear certain clothing or eat certain food unless they tell you that you have to appreciate it. And then I guess you should appreciate it, but maybe not. Maybe you shouldn't do it. Like there's a million rules that constantly evolve. It's, you know, yoga is cultural appropriation because the white ladies that do it don't really understand what all of the culture that comes from. But also we must all abandon our own own, you know, white centric view and experience other cultures. So as again, as you can tell, I find this absurd. And the reason that I find it absurd, and here is the kind of takeaway point here that I want to make about Halloween, culture is appropriation. There is no such thing as cultural appropriation because all culture involves just this thing, involves cross cultural conversations between different races and peoples. It's one of the best things about America. And as always, you know, woke idiocy comes for the best things about our world and our lives and our personhood. Um, cultural appropriation just describes the constant phenomenon of looking back into the past, looking at other cultures and taking stuff that is not yours and making it yours and interacting, developing an interaction between the way that people live in one area and then seeing what sparks fly when it comes up against the way that people live in another area. Halloween in and of itself is an actually great example of that and a good way to talk about what I mean by culture is appropriation. So the festival of Halloween probably has its origins, its most distant origins, let's say in a Gaelic holiday. And when I say Gaelic, I'm talking about um, the sort of indigenous peoples of Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. And this is obviously part of what is now the UK um, and, and Britain. And the, the Gaels uh, celebrated a holiday called Samhain, uh, which is spelled Samhain, S-A-M-H-A-I-N. So if you ever see that written, just know it's pronounced Samhain. And it was one of four quarter days. Uh, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. So there uh, were four quarter days in the Gaelic uh, tradition, uh, and they were used to divide the year into four. That's why they're called quarter days. And so they were markers, markers of the passage of time. Most cultures have them. I think all cultures probably do, although I can't speak with absolute certainty, but I, I can't think of a culture that doesn't have these kind of routine yearly ways to note the passing of the seasons and the passing of the year. Um, the biggest quarter day in the Gaelic tradition is um, this one, Samhain, October 31st to November 1st. Um, and as, you know, 
the culture of the British Isles developed, all sorts of things got placed in this location. So this was when school started again. It was when servants were hired. Um, and of course, before all that and underlying all of that, it's when the harvest ends and the winter begins. So it's the time which we're now in when the dark part of the year sets in. And there are, this is something that lots of people have written about. C.S. Lewis writes very eloquently about it. There are in the structure of the natural world, in the structure of the year, there is a kind of poetry that suggests to us different attitudes and modes of being. Of course, everyone knows this, right? Spring is a time, of course, you know, as we say in the Western tradition for being happy and, and rebirth and renewal. Uh, winter is a time for somber reflection. Uh, for reflection upon death. It's when it's when many of the trees die, right? And many of the sort of foliage goes under the earth. People, things hibernate, animals hibernate. Um, and so there evolved a number of ways of kind of marking this and reflecting upon our own participation in that cycle, namely our own mortality and our own kind of connection to things that have gone by. And so many of the things that the, the kind of most basic traditions that we associate with Halloween can be found in some of these rituals. Divination rituals would occur on this uh, quarter day, this, this spooky day of Samhain. Um, eventually bobbing for apples came to us through this tradition. Um, and then, of course, in comes the Christian church. And so this is what I'm talking about when I talk about culture is appropriation, right? The, one of the things that the Christian church has been hugely successful at doing is taking its own theology and overlaying it onto the culture that it finds in a new area. So obviously the Christian church aspires to universality, aspires, aspires to be all over the world. And when the, you know, when the different cultures were evangelized, the church would basically kind of sweep up the local traditions and cultures into its own way of looking at the world, its own theology, its own uh, cosmology and metaphysics. And so it did this with Samhain and with the traditions of, in the, with the October traditions of the, of the British Isles and the Gales. Um, it, it did it also with, in a totally different context with the Dia de los Muertos, right, the Day of the Dead. And that begins, uh, it has its roots in Aztec festivals um, around the beginning of August. Um, but it's now celebrated on the same day as Halloween, sort of because of Christianity, because Christianity, as it sort of globalizes its culture and its yearly schedule and its liturgical calendar, um, these things start to get standardized. And so that's why, that's why we celebrate a festival with Aztec roots on a day that is totally unrelated to the Aztec festival. It's because it got swept up into this sort of Christianizing of Samhain and of the, um, of the Gaelic tradition. Um, this is a phenomenon called syncretism. And syncretism is the fancier, more intellectually sophisticated word for what Wokesters call cultural appropriation. Now, syncretism is all culture. In fact, the, you know, Rome did it way before the Christian church did it with Greece, right? And, and, and we will talk about this in terms of the Aeneid uh, soon. Um, Islam did uh, this kind of thing with the nomad Arab tribes that came before it, in which it emerged. Um, in America, we do it with every culture because we have this wonderful vision of ourselves as able to accommodate and incorporate elements of all the different cultures that come seeking freedom in America. Um, all the great traditions of the world practice this. It's a way of uh, incorporating other views than your own into your own viewpoint. Because the you know the, the kind of classic leftist thing is well, you should just give up your own viewpoint, and you should totally exp you, know, you should only explore the marginalized traditions. And of course, the that's ludicrous. It's ludicrous because you know you you can't do that. You, there'll always you, there'll always be some sort of culture that you come from. Always there'll always be something that's natural to you, and either you have a way of incorporating other people's viewpoints and, and traditions into that into your own outlook, or you're just being asked basically to go away and die. Right? You, it, it, the idea that you shouldn't culturally appropriate is basically that you should give up yourself. You should go away and not exist and just let other, other cultures exist, which is a foolish, a foolish thing to ask of anybody and also an aggressive, and deceitful thing. Um, so in fact, right, culture is appropriation. Syncretism is what culture is. What is syncretism about? Um, well, for Christians, at least, um, I think that it really is so one way of sort of arguing against Christianity in these terms is, well, Christians claim to have the you know, the soul, the unique truth. 
But you really just, you know, recycling old traditions. And of course, this isn't just the case with Samhain and with, with British tradition, British indigenous traditions, but also, you know, uh, with Christmas, people often, you know, say that it's very similar to the Roman Saturnalia, it happens around the same time and all stuff. Um, so the usual accusation is, well, that, you know, this was just basically the same thing, but, you know, with a new reskinned, as we say in video games, with like a new just look to it. There are those in the Christian tradition, as I've said before, who have advocated for only going by Christian texts and ignoring every other kind of culture. Um, famously, Tertullian in the second and third century AD said, you know, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Meaning we're into Jerusalem and the truth of God and not everything else. However, it is my opinion that there's a much stronger Christian case for arguing that when, when Jesus was resurrected, one of the things he did on the road to Emmaus, for example, this famous story of his appearance on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, is he said, you know, all of the stuff that went before me was a prediction of me. It was, it prefigured me. So in John, the gospel of John, the first chapter, we kind of have the metaphysical reason for thinking this, which is he says, all things came into the world through the son and without him, nothing was made of the things that are made. So everything that exists in creation is made through the son, through Jesus, who is the uh, incarnation of, of God and is the second person of, of God. I think that this is a more philosophically satisfying way to view the Christian truth. And some people sometimes call it the doctrine of common grace. Um, reformed Protestants, especially Protestants in the reformed tradition, call it that. Um, and it basically means that there exists inherent in creation the truth that would be revealed fully in God. So we all have this kind, these kind of hints and inklings. And when I was talking earlier about the way that the seasons suggest to us certain things, like ideas about death and rebirth, what, what Christians tend to say is, well, that was this kind of prefiguration, this intuition that everybody had of the resurrection and that the resurrection is somehow at the heart of all that creation is. That God created knowing man would fall, that man's fall necessitates this constant self-giving forgiveness on the part of God. And that's built even into the structure of the seasons. And so of course, when people go about trying, you know, even in primitive ways, trying to express the truths that they are learning from the natural world and the basic truths of their life and existence, they're going to capture some portion of, of what the truth is that would then be fully revealed in Christ. And of course, you can't see the truth of it without Christ. But once you have seen Christ, then you can look back at all of these traditions and say, oh yeah, that part of it is true. That part is right. That part is good. And select and draw out the stuff that actually does express something real. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, the, the Saturnalia is a good example of that, right? I mentioned this already, that it basically, you know, it sort of becomes, Christianity incorporates a lot of Saturnalian elements in, in its eventual festival of Christmas, not because it's stealing, but because it's showing the true meaning of what was always contained in these stories about Dionysus, um, who is often, who has a lot of elements in his story that are kind of similar to Christ. Well, these were prefigurations and intimations of what was to come. And therefore, we don't have to throw everything out. We just have to fulfill it. We have to fulfill the promise that was written into creation from the beginning, that is written now into all of our best and truest and noblest art and traditions. It's an answer to the problem that I've been describing many times now on, the, on these various episodes that people have, you know, once you have Christianity, what do you do with the vast wisdom of the pagan of pagan antiquity, right? Um, that is what culture is. It's, it's looking at the wisdom that exists currently in the world and then saying, well, based on my own insights and what I know, this is how I think that, you know, uh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to reject this and I'm going to use this. It's what the church has done for its whole history so spectacularly. Culture is appropriation. So now that we've gotten that sort of off the table, right? Um, let's think specifically about Halloween, right? Because a lot of the things that we kind of pretend to believe at Halloween, um, like ghosts, for example, are actually like vaguely incompatible with Christian theology. So, you know, Christianity does this thing where it will take stuff, uh, pagan beliefs that it can't condone and try to find out what is, what is it these beliefs express? Well, in, in, 
In the Christian worldview, I think that one of the things Halloween expresses is the truth that death is not natural, that it's not the end, that when, when this winter comes and when the, you know, the trees lose their leaves and everything looks dead, that spring is coming too, right? And that also the ones that we've lost that seem gone forever still somehow linger. Uh, and Christians would say, yes, they linger in the mind and the heart of God who resurrects, you know, who, who renews all flesh and who will in the end, you know, if we, if we ask and if we seek his son, will we'll renew us. And so Christianity basically takes this and incorporates this idea into All Saints Day, the day of praying for the saints and the, those who have departed. Remember that saint doesn't, doesn't just mean everybody that's been canonized as a saint. It means everybody that's been saved by Christ. And all, you know, the, the, the hagioi, uh, which is the, the Greek word that Paul uses, is literally just the sanctified ones, the ones that have been sanctified by, uh, by their faith in Jesus. And so all of this stuff that has always existed throughout history, these, these visions in, in Roman and Greek literature of going down to the underworld and grasping at shades, Odysseus trying to hold the shade of his mother, Anticlia, in the, in the underworld, but being unable, um, you know, these, uh, and all these, and there, there were ghost stories, right? There was a play by Plautus in the first, um, he, he was in the first and second centuries BC that he wrote, and he, he wrote a play, The Mostelaria, The Haunted House. So all of these intuitions that something lingers on after a person is dead are, are captured in Halloween, which, which rolls up not only the Christian idea of All Saints Day, but also, you know, um, but also the, uh, ideas that are contained in Samhain and and the ideas of the Dia de los Muertos, all of that stuff gets kind of pulled into one. Um, and you have, uh, you know, All Hallows' Eve, the eve of um, the day when the saints will kind of be in contact, when we will be in contact with the saints. So in celebration of this great syncretic, culturally appropriative uh, masterpiece of the Western tradition, which is Halloween, we are going to read and talk about one of the great masters of freaky literature, Edgar Allan Poe. And before we begin to do that, I will briefly pause and say thank you for being here. Happy Halloween. Glad you're joining us on this strange Halloween. Um, if you have not already, please do subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening, you're listening. So you got to be listening somewhere, YouTube or, uh, or Apple Podcasts or Google Play or what have you. Just hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And leave us a five-star review on iTunes if you like the show. It really helps us to get the word out. And the show is growing in such a wonderful way. I'd love for you to be a part of that. Thanks for joining. Let's read The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. I'm going to jump right on in first by reading this. I have had this edition of Poe since high school, since my American lit class in high school. And I dug it up. And this is the opening of The Fall of the House of Usher, one of my favorite Poe stories. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length found myself, as the shades of the evening drew on, within view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half-pleasurable because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveler upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil." So a wonderful, wonderful writer, a prose stylist beyond compare was Poe. And this is, you know, high Gothic literature. Gothic literature is a kind of a, it's really a subspecies of romantic literature. And um, the, the kind of romantic period is this period in uh, the 18th and 19th century of an artistic movement toward nature and toward the heights of passion that are contained in nature. There's a preoccupation with the sublime, which is the experience of something that so overloads your senses that it kind of breaks the bound of 
all the categories you have. You're not sure if you feel fear or delight or both uh, or some mixture of something else, you know. Um, that's the sublime. And the, this way of kind of getting to the unruliness of nature and the freedom, the wildness of nature uh, is close to the romantic tradition. And then the the horror element of it and the kind of macabre and, and fear of the unknown that exists in that is the Gothic kind of dimension of, of the romantic tradition. The whole thing, as I've noted, is kind of a reaction to Newton, to this world-changing set of observations. Um, Newton, 1643 to 1727, right? So that's slightly before all of this. Um, and then even earlier, Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, yeah. Um, this 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 idea of the scientific revolution and the notion that all of the world could be described as a machine, as a clockwork thing with predictable inputs and outputs um, was very exciting and very powerful. Of course, Newton and his laws of physics make so many things possible. Um, but I've and I've said this before when we talked about Euripides, right? The romantic reaction against that, capital R romantic, not sort of I'm in love with you romantic. Uh, the romantic reaction against that is um, there's more than than just physical stuff which behaves according to these predictable rules. And there are, to quote Hamlet, uh, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Um, and as I've said before, the English romantics, um, John Keats, for example, and the, the painter Benjamin Hayden, um, this is from an 1817 record by Hayden. The English romantics used to toast Newton's health and confusion to mathematics. The whole movement is about the stuff that doesn't fit into the kind of Newtonian world. It's sort of like, yes, but. Yes, there are rules to the way that the physical world works. But there's always something at the edge that you can't define. God is more creative and the world is more strange um, in both good and bad ways, in, in delightful ways and in chilling ways. Uh, the world is more strange than Newton would like it to be. And, and Poe really digs into that basically by giving us this sense of a world pervaded, animated by more than just what you see and can describe literally. Um, so now we're into the 19th century, right? And there's a um, there's really kind of a, a flourishing of American arts and letters going on. Um, and in addition to the kind of romantic Gothic uh, tradition, which is well, well underway at this point, um, you also have the development in America of transcendentalism, um, which was super hot by the time Poe is writing. Um, in, a, in an earlier story, which we will also kind of visit, Legia, um, from 1838, um, there is one main character, the, uh, the woman who will eventually die and take over the body of another woman, the title character, Legia, is, is studying transcendentalism with her lover. So there was something very potent about uh, this idea, and it included a sense of what you might call immanentism with an A, not imminent, like about to happen, but immanent, the sense that there is a sort of world spirit pervading all of matter that makes it more than just a series of atoms bouncing off of each other. Um, most famous transcendentalist apologists are Henry David Thoreau, so uh, 1817 to 62, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803 to 1882. Um, and this sort of their writings and their work give you a lot of insight, I think, into Poe and who he was and what he was working on. Emerson himself was the son of a Unitarian minister, but also this kind of outspoken critic of, of Christian organized religion. Um, and just before Legia and then, and then Usher, The Fall of the House of Usher, Emerson uh, published his first book, which is called The Nature. 1836. Um, and so here's a passage from, from Emerson's work on nature. He says, the advantage of the ideal theory over the popular faith is this, that it presents the world in precisely that view which is most desirable to the mind. It is, in fact, the view which reason, both speculative and practical, that is, philosophy and virtue, take. For, seen in the light of thought, the world always is phenomenal, and virtue subordinates it to the mind. Uh, so phenomenal means the way that you experience. It's not like, wow, that's phenomenal. It's the phenomena, the things that you see and that appear to you. It's from a Greek word meaning to appear. And virtue subordinates it to the mind. So he's saying mind gathers all of our sense impressions together. And reason is not just about X plus B equals 
see, right? It's not just about calculating, you know, algebraic formulas, but it's about um, gathering from your sense impressions um, this this sense of of virtue and truth. Um, idealism sees the world in God. It beholds the whole circle of persons and things, of actions and events, of country and religion, not as painfully accumulated, atom after atom, act after act, in an aged creeping past, but as one vast picture which God paints on the instant eternity for the contemplation of the soul. Therefore, the soul holds itself off from a too trivial and microscopic study of the universal tablet. It respects the end too much to immerse itself in the means. It sees something more important in Christianity than the scandals of ecclesiastical history. So there's more to the Christian worldview than just, you know, when they were arguing over the details of the Trinity. Um, or the niceties of criticism, and very incurious concerning persons or miracles, not at all disturbed by chasms of historical evidence, it accepts from God the phenomenon as it finds it, as the pure and awful form of religion in the world. It is not hot and passionate at the appearance of what it calls its own good or bad fortune, at the union or opposition of other persons. No man is its enemy. It accepts whatsoever befalls as part of its lesson. It is a watcher more than a doer, and it is a doer only that it may the better watch. There is a lot of uh, similarity here to Stoicism, to the idea of an all-pervading mind that is to be found in creation, is to be found in the material world. Um, and also this sense that, you know, we, we cultivate a certain passivity. The, the Stoic Greek word for this is ataraxia, literally unbotheredness, untroubledness. Um, and in my view, transcendentalism is basically the best and the worst of American philosophy and theology. Um, and, and let me say what I mean by that a little bit, because it'll help us to understand Poe, as well as be kind of important for understanding where America is now. Um, Unitarianism, which, as I said, is kind of the tradition out of which Emerson emerges, has, for most of American history, being sort of the alternative to Calvinism. So Calvinism, which of course originates with John Calvin, this Swiss theologian, 1509 to 64. Calvinism is sort of the, the strict theolo theological backbone of Puritanism. Uh, and Puritanism, of course, is what inspired the English reformers to purify the Church of England. So in the 16th century, and then, you know, eventually the, the Puritans uh, were a huge part of founding and building America. And that's that moral backbone of early colonial America, sort of roughly speaking, comes from Calvinism and Puritanism. Um, Unitarianism dates from around the same time, but it comes from Poland and Transylvania. Um, and strictly speaking, it is a heresy. Um, and, and I say that not to uh, denigrate it out of hand, not to just completely dismiss it, but I, I mean that as a technical term. That is, it is a the Greek word is hyresis, a choosing another option besides the doctrine, the central doctrine of the church. The heresy that uh, Unitarianism is, is that God is not one in three persons. He's not a trinity. He's just one, hence Unitarianism. Um, and Unitarianism has proven very amenable over time to the more sort of amorphous and iconoclastic impulse in the American spirit. This is, you know, hence Emerson's critique of organized religion. It sort of tends uh, over time to reject tight strictures. And so sometimes when I talk about the, you know, the difference between believing in systems and acknowledging that there's more than just the system, that there's more outside the system, that is kind of the influence of Unitarianism. And Unitarianism kind of goes to those excesses in ways that can be very destructive, um, but also do kind of motivate a lot of insight in the American character. It's a sort of complicated interaction between the, strict, the strictness of Calvinism and the fluidity, the openness of, of Unitarianism. Um, and, and that influences the American character greatly during this time, uh, and, and all, as does transcendentalism, which is kind of part and parcel of that back and forth. Um, so this is what, the, in the 19th century when Poe is writing, this is really what uh, may be called the American Renaissance. That's a term from F.O. Matheson. Um, the American Renaissance is, is it's not all about transcendentalism, but it, it does include that and kind of wraps it up into this 
flourishing of, of American arts and letters, um, which includes an attempt, as, as Rome tried to distinguish itself from Greece, you get an attempt on America's part to distinguish itself from Britain, um, artistically especially. So you get Whitman, Twain, Hawthorne, Emerson, right? All these people we're going to talk about. And Whitman is a great example of that, you know, unruliness, the insistence on you know, it's not just what the astronomer tells you, it's also you going out and looking at the stars. The insistence upon the complexity, the multitudinousness of the human person and its, and its um, inability to be contained. Um, Poe lived in this period as well. Uh, lived a short life, 1809 to, to um, 1849. And uh, it, was a, it was a pretty sad life. You know, he was, he was abandoned very, very early on by his father, who was an actor. His mother died. Um, and so he left them, the Poes, they were the Poes, um, to be with the Allens, his foster family. So hence, hence the Edgar Allan Poe, right? Uh, while he was still an infant, he's with the Allens. Um, and he's the first major American author to make a living writing, uh, which is not an easy life. It involves a lot of uncertainty. Um, and in fact, his life was quite tragic. I mean, a lot of gambling. He, it was alcoholism that probably did him in in the end. But he also kind of, he both shows the influence of this period, the American Renaissance, and stands alone in it as being this hyper-Gothic sort of poet and short story writer of the macabre and the strange. Um, and this idea that nature is suffused with God and that, that kind of all nature gathered up into one creates this huge whole picture that's more than the sum of its parts. That's a very beautiful poetic idea, but Poe kind of turns it on its head. And in, even in that opening that I read, right, the idea that the house is alive, right? If there's something very eerie about it um, and sort of and, and fearful, fearsome, um, there is kind of a sense of claustrophobia in it too. And this is, Usher is dominated. The fall of the house of Usher is dominated by a sense of claustrophobia. The idea is that there's only one heir to the house of Usher, meaning the, the, the sort of estate of Usher and the family of Usher. Um, and the Usher family also owns this physical house. So the physical house and the house in terms of, you know, the, the bloodline are all dependent on this one person, this terrible claustrophobia. And, and, and at one point, the, the main character who is, or one of the main characters who is Usher, who's ill um, and kind of has, has gone a little bit insane in this house. He's painting this um, huge, long underground corridor. And, and Poe, or the narrator rather, sort of compares it to the paintings of um, Fuseli. Fuseli is these kind of, you know, nightmarish uh, depictions of, of strange landscapes and, and scenes. And this is even more abstract. And so incredibly spooky, difficult to put your finger on, just kind of just outside uh, the scene, right? Um, and, and the other thing, of course, that's going on is... Um, that his sister, the sister of Usher, um, is, is ill with catalepsy. Catalepsy causes paralysis and spasms. Um, and so she's wandering the halls, um, this sort of eerie, ghostly figure, um, and he is going a little bit insane. Uh, so these two ushers, the brother and sister, um, and at the beginning, near the outset, the scene that I uh, read is followed shortly by, she's, the sister kind of appears suddenly, this ghostly presence. And that's the sense that the house has. It's a very short story, by the way, so you can go away and read the whole thing if you like. But uh, they, they sort of develop this intimate relationship. The narrator and Usher kind of get in, uh, into close proximity with one another. And then the narrator is there in, in many ways to kind of take care of these two sickly uh, people whose minds aren't quite right. And then Usher is sharing with the narrator all of this sort of eerie, almost half-finished, very elusive, strange work that he's doing. He shares this ballad that he's written at one point. And the narrator says, I well remember that suggestions arising from this ballad led us into a train of thought wherein there became manifest an opinion of Usher's, which I mention not so much on account of its novelty, for other men have thought thus, as on account of the pertinacity with which he maintained it. This opinion, in its general form, was that of the sentience of all vegetable things. Vegetable meaning sort of not animate, but still kind of moving about. Um, so like plants, for example. Uh, but in his disordered fancy, the idea had assumed a more daring character and trespassed under certain conditions upon the kingdom of inorganization. So this is the idea that life, you know, vegetable life even has this organized uh, 
logic to it. But then it's also kind of just raw matter, he thinks, has life. I lack words to express the full extent or the earnest abandon of his persuasion. The belief, however, was connected, as I have previously hinted, with the gray stones of the home of his forefathers. The conditions of the sentience had been there, he imagined, fulfilled in the method of collocation of these stones, in the order of their arrangement, as well as in that of the many fungi which overspread them, and of the decayed trees which stood around, above all in the long undisturbed endurance of this arrangement, and in its reduplication in the still waters of the tarn, that's the kind of marsh around the house, the evidence of the sentience was to be seen, he said, and here I started as he spoke, note, note the rhythm of that prose, so um, carefully done, that it sounds like a kind of frantic madman, right? It's evidence, the evidence of the sentience was to be seen, he said, and here I started as he spoke, right? This is wonderful kind of rhythm in the gradual yet certain condensation of an atmosphere of their own about the waters and the walls. The result was discoverable, he added, in that silent yet importunate and terrible influence which for centuries had molded the destinies of his family and which made him what I now saw him, what he was. Such opinions need no comment, and I will make none. There is a um, rhetorical figure called praetoritio, which means mentioning something by not mentioning it. And that last line is this wonderful exercise in praetoritio. It's like, well, they kind of, those opinions do need comments. I would like to hear what you think about it. But in, by leaving it unsaid, he kind of just lets you think the worst and the creepiest. Um, and this is just a tremendously eerie kind of expression of the, all of the ideas that we've been talking about, that the whole world is kind of governed by some form of, form of sensu sentience, and it's not benevolent. It's actually sinister. Um, this is why he's so great to read at Halloween. Right? So, this, so the sister dies, we think, and they bury her temporarily. Um, and this is just, you know, the kind of uh, usher comes up with this idea. And the narrator says, I could not help thinking of the wild ritual of this work and of its probable influence upon the hypochondriac when one evening, having informed me abruptly that the Lady Madeline was no more, he stated his intention of preserving her corpse for a fortnight previously to its final internment in one of the numerous vaults within the main walls of the building. The worldly reason, however, assigned for this singular proceeding was one which I did not feel at liberty to dispute. The brother had been led to his resolution, so he told me, by consideration of the unusual character of the malady of the deceased, of certain obtrusive and eager inquiries on the part of her medical men, and of the remote and exposed situation of the burial ground of the family. So they're storing the body kind of away from these medical men who maybe are trying to use it for research, maybe trying to do something sinister with it, um, and they're storing it instead in the walls um, so that they can kind of have it for a fortnight until they take it to the true burial ground. I will not deny, says the narrator, that when I called to mind the sinister countenance of the person whom I met upon the staircase, that's the doctor, on the day of my arrival at the house, I had no desire to oppose what I regarded as at best but a harmless and by no means an unnatural precaution. At the request of Usher, I personally aided him in the arrangements for the temporary entombment. The body having been encoffined, we two alone bore it to its rest. So this, uh, you know, claustrophobia of being alone in a house that seems to be alive, and you're you're burying, you're temporarily encoffining, as they say, uh, this this dead body that's kind of crowded about by all these strange medical men. Um, really, just the height of this kind of gothic sense of chill and fear. Um, and of course, Frankenstein is another you know, good example when we're talking about the Gothic, right? You can imagine Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is like a big part of this too. Um, somewhat earlier, but still. The vault in which we placed it and which had been so long unopened that our torches half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere gave us little opportunity for investigation was small, damp, and entirely without means of admission for light, lying at great depth immediately beneath that portion of the building in which was my own sleeping apartment. So right under his bed is this dead woman. It had been used apparently in remote feudal times for the worst purposes of a dungeon keep, and in later days as a place of deposit for powder or some other highly combustible substance as a portion of its floor and the whole interior of a long archway through which we reached it were carefully sheathed with copper. The door of massive iron had been also similarly protected. Its immense weight caused an unusually sharp grating sound as it moved upon its hinges. And at this point, you probably know what is coming. What I'm going to say, she's not actually dead. Uh, and there is this, you know, of course, the catalepsy contributes to this, that they bury her too early. And on this stormy, stormy night, 
um, Usher is sort of go- still going yet more mad. Um, and in order to try to calm him down, the narrator starts reading to him, but they hear these noises. They're, they're talking about, you know, is, do you hear it? What's going on? And the narrator says, do you hear it? Don't you hear it? And Usher says, not hear it. Yes, I hear it. And have heard it long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not. I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago. Yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred. Ha! And the breaking of the hermit's door. This is part of the story that he's been reading. And the death cry of the dragon and the clangor of the shield say, rather, the rending of her coffin. So the noises sounded like they were maybe associated with the story, but they're the rending of her coffin and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison and her struggles with the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for her haste? Have I not heard her footstep on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman. Here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables as if in the effort he were giving up his soul. Madman, I tell you that she now stands without the door and as if in superhuman energy of his utterance there had been found the potency of a spell. The huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of the rushing gust. But then, without those doors, there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the thresholds. Then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother and in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated, which is, of course, the fall of the house of Usher, right? That's the end of Usher because there's only one heir. From that chamber and from that mansion, I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full, setting, and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure of which I have before spoken as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters and the deep and dark tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. Thus ends the fall of the House of Usher. So of course it's the fall of the family and the fall of the house. And that sort of parallelism expresses everything about this story and about the philosophy that generates it, right? This sense that our personal drama is written into the structure of the cosmos and the way that we live and experience the world kind of is the whole thing. That All of this, it goes right back to what I was saying at the beginning, that the seasons themselves contain the truth of God and of the human experience in them. This, this inchoate angst that the whole natural world is actually about us. It's about our experience and our moral actions or our immoral actions and the way that it folds inward upon this poor, broken man to basically collapse itself in this story. It's brilliant, brilliant writing, brilliant work. Uh, And it's the height of this kind of gothic offshoot of romanticism uh, and the horror of the sublime. And and there's actually, uh, I've mentioned a couple of times, this other story, Legia, which I also recommend reading. It's a similar kind of idea. um, But in this case, it's this woman who basically inhabits, this dead woman who inhabits another woman uh, by the sheer force of her will. And it begins with this quote from the English clergyman Joseph Glanville. This was a kind of influential figure in Poe's uh, mind, and, and he was a, a, a 17th century uh, writer, and he has this quote, and the will therein lieth, which dieth not, who knoweth the mysteries of the will with its vigor, 
For God is but a great will, pervading all things by nature of its intentness. Man doth not yield himself to the angels, nor unto death utterly, save only through the weakness of his feeble will. And there's the rub of it, right? This is this Christian idea, this Christian intuition that the human soul is something so powerful that ultimately it cannot die. And it will either continue on in suffering or continue on in glory. And Christianity says, yes, it is God who intervenes to make the difference between those two things. But until then, in this world where death does exist, all we have is this kind of sense of something beyond what we see and experience. And Halloween and, and the, you know, this tradition that we have of telling scary stories and telling ghost stories somehow acknowledges some portion of that and the horror of it, the angst of being in a world where things that shouldn't die do. And what's funny about these stories is what happens in them actually is that things that have died don't, right? And so that's kind of this weird inversion of our sense that nothing actually dies, right? That not no human being, no human soul is fully extinguished, but actually they continue after death. Poe wasn't a preacher. He wasn't this, you know, philosopher or a writer of, of theological treatises. Um, he was a teller of tales and a master of mood, right? But he he deserves his place in this rank in the ranks of the West precisely because he kind of he takes this deeply Christian unease that is augmented by this kind of American sense of the unruliness of the, you know, of, of the, and America's, America's love unruliness. They love the unruliness of the West, the undiscovered country, right? But then there's also this fear of it that Poe just masterfully manipulates. And that is, you know, it's what Halloween is about. It's about, it's, it's what Edgar Allan Poe does. Um, and, and this idea that if, if we, just sort of get rid of all of that. If we simply reject, you know, the the stuff, the unruliness and the weirdness of the stuff that comes down to us from other cultures, but we charge forth into this perfect progressive future where we can plan everything and we can resist having even one death from coronavirus and we can just, you know, so perfectly calculate all of the different structures of our society that nothing will ever go wrong or bad. Um, if we if we believe that we're fools and we'll ultimately be, you know, will come back to bite us in the end. So Poe and Halloween, right, it all kind of reminds us that none of that is actually, none of that, nothing is perfect in this world. And you're just not going to sort of wish away or mathematically equate away the strangeness and the unease of living in a world where death exists. Um, so if you can, ignore Dr. Fauci and go trick-or-treating. Damn it. <laughs> it's a huge part of our history. It's a central part of our history. It's not just some silly thing where kids dress up. It's, it's a way of connecting to our deepest and most uh, almost primitive, but I would call it just earliest and most basic insights about the world and experiences of the natural world around us. It's a wonderful holiday. I hope you have a great one, and I hope you enjoyed this Halloween Young Heretics special. Let's do the mailbag. Mailbag questions come to me through Twitter, and if you want to ask me one, all you have to do is tweet at me, at Spencer Clavin, and Put a hashtag young heretics in the question so that I know to find it. I can just type that into the search then. So here is one that I love. I always say this, but this is a good one. <laughs> it's from the Twitter account, Arthur King of the Kittens. And so it's at Arthur Kittens. Do you think a rebirth of the West will be a bit more mindless a project than intellectuals think? In other words, intelligence always seems to be in the background of great cultural explosions, action and energy in the foreground. It seems our rationalizing these phenomena, however, intelligent people, excuse me, in our rationalizing these phenomena, however, intelligent people look for the intellectual forces rather than the comprehensive manifold that make such things. This is obviously a person who's thought quite deeply about this because, first of all, he expresses himself very eloquently, but also there is uh, much, much here, and we could and probably will do a whole podcast episode just on this. The short answer to your question is yes, and I actually think that conservatives spend a lot of time making the perfect argument about why things have gone wrong and not a ton of time paying attention to the actual human people who are already out in the streets trying to do stuff for the good, right? Um, my, my pal Kyle Schindler, who writes at The American Mind sometimes, has emphasized this, that you know, one day spent building your following on Twitter is is like nothing compared to one day spent meeting with like moms in your local uh, area. And, and the reason for this is that people intuit stuff before they can articulate it. Actually, the reason I chose this question today is because it has a lot to do with what I've been saying, that these, these 
sort of indescribable and not totally graspable features of the natural world and of just basic human experience contain all of the most profound truths. And the job, in some sense, of philosophers and of people, critics like me and people that, you know, do work with words, the, my job is not to teach you something you don't know. This is a big, a big misunderstanding. My job is not to tell you something you don't already know, although sometimes I tell you facts you don't know. But really what I'm here to do is I'm here to give voice to what you already know and live out sometimes in your life so that you can see, it's like a reflection back at, at the truths that are deep in your heart, right? And, and that is the, supposed to be the job of intellectual elites. It's not to dictate from the top down to people how they are supposed to live. It's to find what is true and good and noble and elevate it and give it the most, the kind of purest expression, the purest linguistic dressing that we possibly can. It's an important job and I love doing it, don't get me wrong, but it's not the heart of, of cultural and social revival. You are the heart. The people out listening to this show are on the front lines of the culture war. I'm the standard bearer of the culture war, but you're on the front lines. And yes, it takes people standing up in, in courage and saying that, you know, the mask mandate is ridiculous. It takes people doing stuff that other people are going to look askance at them for. Um, and it takes just individuals saying, no, I, I, I won't lie to get a, a good grade on my college paper. You know, yes, I will say the truth that I'm voting for Donald Trump or whatever. You know, um, those kinds of individual moments of heroism by people who maybe don't do stuff in the most eloquent or graceful or, or uh, stylish way. That is kind of where social revival has to come from. But you need both prongs. You need that and then you need, I think, uh, intellectual leaders true intellectual leaders, not people who just have fancy credentials, but people that genuinely have earned their right to give guidance and to speak into the heart of a moment. Um, it's it's it always the fault of intellectuals that they view this stuff in terms of like getting the ideas right. But that comes second. Getting First of all, first of all, there's the movement and then there's the ideas. I hope that answers the question. It's a great one. And it's been a pleasure, as always, to be with you. Thanks for listening and watching. If you love this show, you will love the Claremont Institute, where I work. Uh, they generously and, and graciously sort of support me morally in this uh, and support me in other ways as well to do this podcast. Um, and you should read our writing. We work at the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind, and we are specifically sort of an American think tank uh, dedicated to the revivifying of the founding ideals. Donate to us at claremont.org slash donate. Let them know we sent you. Tell them that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics, and we will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Mm -hmm.